Well, hello. This is Peter Combs from Bitamount.com and P.L. Combs Asian Art. And today is May 25th, 2018. And uh, we're heading into the Memorial Day weekend around here on, on the island. And I hope everybody's planning on going somewhere, being with families, having cookouts. Uh, we are. And um, I wanted to uh, follow up on uh, last week. I mentioned that we were going to uh, take a look at the London auction results for Christie's, Bonhams, and Sotheby's because they had some uh, Sotheby's and Christie's had some disappointments, unfortunately, and uh, in that they didn't sell either of their cover lots, their major cover lots from the sale, which is sort of unusual. But we're going to get into that in a little in a little bit of a few minutes here. But first, I wanted to talk about this. This was one of the big exciting things from uh, London. Uh, two weeks ago, and it was sold at Bonhams. It was uh, they did a separate catalog for it, but it was included in this catalog as a, as a, as a lot number. I think it was lot 151 or something. But it was this fabulous uh, Jing Tai marked uh, Ming uh, gilt bronze butter lamp. All right, and these things are enormous. These are very big. It's not something you put on a table. And they were used in temples uh, to to uh, uh, to keep the the uh, the altar area lit to keep the light coming. As the, it, was, it was all about light and so forth. And uh, they were attended to by um, uh, Buddhist monks, and they would burn yak butter in them or oil. And you can see here. Here's a, a scene. If you can see it, it where it's 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 uh, being it's where it's lit. Okay, it looks like they have lights in. It. I don't think they're burning oil in this because the smoke from burning yak butter is pretty brutal. But at any rate, there's the bronze. And it's a great big one, it had an interesting history. Uh, they, they did a, a fabulous write-up in the catalog, everything you ever wanted to know about butter lamps. And uh, what was interesting about this was that the, the Jing Dai mark that's on here, the uh, author of this uh, write-up, uh, went into some detail about the mark because there's something very unusual about it. You notice that um, the first two characters and then the fifth character in the mark are in the casting. And then they, these, the other three, the, 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 the third, fourth, and last mark um, were applied, it looks, later. And uh, the reason they speculate is that the Jing Tai was a very short reign, um, only about eight years from 14, what was the date, 1449 to 1457. Uh, but he was he was a, a big fan of Buddhism, and um, they think that this bronze was probably cast in the previous reign and sort of left blank for future use because these were given to um, favored uh, uh, Buddhist uh, monks and favored temples, imperial temples, and this was probably most likely cast in an imperial workshop um, for such purposes. And uh, it did really well. But you've got to come and read the article. The article, the piece on this is really interesting if you're not familiar with these. It ended up selling for $1.7 million, okay? Um, I don't know what the exact estimate was because it was estimate on request and I didn't check. But I'm going to guess it was somewhere up in that range. Uh, seeing as it was Bonhams, they tend to be uh, very, uh, they put gentle estimates on things because they want to encourage bidding, which is a smart idea. And we're going to see why it's so smart in a minute. But um, we're going to first hop over here to the uh, Christie's, I mean to the Bonhams, rest of their sale. And they had a good sale. And the first piece we're going to look at is this one. It was this fabulous um, uh, Shang to Western Zhao uh, Dynasty Fang Ding. It had a beautiful patina on it. Um, uh, a wonderful form, uh, but the, the surface on this thing was just fabulous. That, that beautiful deep green and uh, beautifully carved uh, or cast uh, dowdy masks and so forth. And had a, they gave it several pages of phot photography. Um, it had been in a great collection. It had been estimated at 120 to 150,000 pounds, which is roughly 155, 60,000 to about 220,000, I guess, somewhere in there. And it went right through that estimate and it ended up going for 494,000 pounds. Just demolished the estimate. And the reason was was that they, it had a very long uh, exhibition history, including the Oriental Ceramic Society um, and a bunch of other places. It had been published in books. And uh, that, that kind of background really pushes uh, for a good price. And Bonhams wisely um, didn't overestimate it. Okay? The, the, things will find their own level in, in the market with or without um, strong estimates. Strong estimates scare off people, frankly. And uh, then they had these. These were extraordinary. These are monumental. Uh, late Ming um, Dynasty, late 16th, early 17th century, turquoise glaze uh, uh, foo lions. Uh, they had a very nice uh, write up on these. These were 80 inches tall, so roughly seven and a half feet tall, or six and a half feet tall, rather, almost seven feet. And um, just absolutely spectacular. And they were estimated at 150 to 250,000 pounds. 
And uh, they went right through that, made short work of it, and went for 687,000 pounds, all right? But they were extremely beautiful. They had been uh, 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 handled by C.T. Lou years ago, and uh, lots of interest in these. And uh, they were beautiful. The, the work on these was just the, the ferocious faces, just fabulous. The glazing was impeccable all the way down. And these had belonged to the Empress Dowager, this, this pair, at some point, apparently. All right, and uh, just absolutely great, and uh, so and they and, and rightfully so they went they went for a very good price, but they deserved it. All right, and the, the the last thing I wanted to point out was this: the this shows you how little people care about estimates. Um, and uh, the, 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 this was a, a beautiful fine. I don't know if anybody noticed it. It was lot number ninety-two, fine Hongmu Dragon Throne, Qing Dynasty. They didn't give it uh, too accurate of a date because they're hard to date, but. Um, very similar to Chin Lung examples, and they put a pretty modest estimate on it of 20 to 30,000 pounds. But look at the work on this. This was all Hong Mu, beautifully carved. Beautifully carved. Hong Mu can almost look like Zitan wood. And um, it ended up selling for, uh, get this, 413,000 pounds. So, because some people say to me, well, you know, it doesn't, setting a high estimate, you know, push the price up. And I, and I always feel, no, it doesn't make any difference because. People that buy these things know what they're worth on the market. What the, what a low estimate tells you is is that if the estimate is twenty to thirty thousand pounds, <clears throat> you can potentially buy this probably for fifteen thousand pounds. So it gets people excited and interest because they, they may have a shot, and they get excited about it also because a low estimate typically indicates it hasn't been on the market. Okay, a bunch of dealers haven't seen it and said no to it. You know, because things do go to auction that have been rejected by dealers. I mean that happens all the time. So low estimate. You know, modest uh, everything, uh, big results can happen, all right? And uh, now let's hop over here to the Sotheby's catalog. Here's the, the moon flask that didn't get off the ground, unfortunately. Um, it was a beautiful thing. But uh, as I mentioned last week, there was a pair of them, uh, that, and they were a different, different pattern, but big blue and white moon flask, chin lung mark. They had, they, those had lotus petals on the, on the fronts and backs of them. But um, a couple of years ago, and, and the pair went for $2.8 million. And uh, this particular flask was estimated at 1 to 1 1.4 um, million pounds, which, which means in dollars it was estimated a million, million three or four to a million seven for one. And uh, a rule of thumb in, the, in, the, in, the, in, in, in how I look at it is, is that a pair is worth about three times the price of a single, all right, and um, as, a, as a general rule of thumb. So if a pair is worth 2.8 million from two years ago, for a pair of flasks that haven't been on the market in a hundred years, and they had photographs of them in the house and where they came from and how they were acquired, all that powerful history, and they bring 2.8 million, a single coming up a year and a half later, putting a, a giant estimate like that on it may not be the smartest thing to do. <clears throat> I suspect if they'd put an estimate of six to 800,000 pounds, it probably would have sold. But uh, uh, perhaps, I don't know who it belongs to, but... Um, um, the, the result was was unfortunate because they're a lovely lovely vase. It's just I think the estimate was too strong, and I think it was too strong on the Christie's cover lot. All right, but then we had this. This was a very nice vase, and I talked about this one last week. I thought it was very reasonably estimated, absolutely beautiful, an unmarked um, Chin Lung period vase. It's odd that it wasn't marked because this thing was so beautifully done, just absolutely amazing, uh, outstanding quality. And I had said that you know the the estimate on this was a uh, uh, what was it 100 to 200 thousand pounds or 140 to 260 thousand dollars, and uh, you know with a mark on it it would have brought a lot more. Well, even without a mark, this did awfully well. Uh, uh, amazingly, it brought uh, 657 thousand uh, pounds, uh, but absolutely beautiful. Just a, a great looking, uh, great looking vase. Um, really, really pretty, and. Uh, you know, it, it, it found its, it, you know, auctions will find their own level, as they say. All right, and this was a case where it did it. All right, and they always do anyway. All right, but then you had this. This was nice, and I didn't mention this last week. I liked it, and um, you know, I liked Sung Pieces, but I was trying to cover other things. It was this uh, really nice uh, uh, Yuzhao pear-shaped, uh, this is a, a Jin Dynasty uh, uh, tr uh, Celadon glazed vase. Uh, it was 11 inches tall. And uh, had been sold uh, at Sotheby's in 2003, sort of before the boom in, in Sung and, and, and uh, um, uh, gin pieces took off. 
uh, had a nice crackle in the glaze. If you, if you blow it up, you can really see it. And it was just, but the shape was beautiful. It did have an absolutely beautiful shape. And it was estimated at, uh, what was the estimate on this? It was pretty reasonable, 60 to 80,000 pounds. And uh, it went for 789,000. Blew that estimate away and went way up, all right? And what that, what that means is, is that uh, either, either the seller knowingly put, had them put a low estimate on it or swing pieces are really starting to move. So uh, we'll keep an eye on that, all righty? And now let's hop over to the Christie's sale. All right, here it is. Here's the um, unsold moon flask, unfortunately. This very pretty Falunkai vase. They did videos on it. They took great photography of it. Um, it was a wonderful example. There was nothing wrong with it. Um, other than that, I think the estimate was a little too aggressive for something that had been on the market in the last 10 or 15 years. And I think you're going to see the auction uh, houses getting uh, a lot more careful about this in the future. And we'll get to that in a minute, okay? But first, I wanted to cover this. Um, this was that very pretty uh, cloisonne uh, Chinlung uh, uh, workshop uh, vase. Here it is. Uh, just absolutely elegant. I talked about this a bit because I just liked it. I thought, boy, it's really nice. It has a nice, uh, there's the four character mark on the bottom. And uh, they, again, they, they put a fairly uh, reasonable estimate on it of 50 to 80,000 uh, pounds. And uh, it did just fine. It brought 97 and a half thousand pounds. And this was pretty small. This was only four inches tall, but it was a gem. It was just, just a gem-like small thing and uh, really, really pretty. And then uh, we're going to... I keep looking over because I have a list of, of page numbers to hop over to. There we go. Was this. Was this uh, Hongxi period um, um, uh, ritual, um, uh, altar uh, ritual piece in beautiful yellow glaze with these um, uh, these head handles on it. And... Uh, Here's a, here's a good look at the glaze. and you, When you look at these, you can notice the bits of unevenness in the glaze back then because uh, it was the Hongxi period. This was not a marked piece, uh, but it was nice size. It was uh, 33 centimeters, so it was a little over a foot tall. And uh, it was estimated uh, at 40 to 60,000 pounds, and uh, it did just fine. It brought 81,000 pounds. Went right through its estimate, right up to where it belonged. Um, and as you know, these, these became very popular in the Qinlung period. Um, they, they did a lot of revival pieces in this form in monochromes. He was a, they were, the, the workshops were very fond of going back and looking at early examples and then reproducing them, uh, but generally with, with rain marks on them, okay? All right. And now here's the vase that didn't, didn't find a home, unfortunately. But the estimate on it, I, I mentioned this, I think I hinted at this last week, it was 600 to 800,000 pounds, which is basically is 850,000 to 1.1 million for a six-inch vase that had been on the market uh, um, as, as recently as uh, 11 years ago. It had been on the market in 2004. Um, it, you know, it's, it's, unfortunately, with things coming in and out, of, we're increasingly we're seeing when things come in and out of the market, the investment side of just buying things, hanging on to it for eight years, and then bumping the value by a big percentage and putting it back out there, you need collectors that want to buy it because it's unusual. And, and hasn't been around, and they love buying fresh things to the market. This was this was a beautiful thing, imperial thing, but like the other the other flask, it wasn't fresh to the market particularly, and it isn't in a sector that's seeing a lot of rise in price. So I think that, that putting a huge estimate on it um, was sort of a mistake. All right, and I think you're going to see the auction houses get a lot tougher uh, coming along uh, in the future. Um, on, on high price things because they put a lot of them. They, you know, Christie's did, a, Christie's did a great job promoting it. Sotheby's did a great job promoting their piece. There's no fault there. Um, it's just that, uh, uh, you know, auction consigners have to, uh, uh, you know, when you're dealing with these auction houses, you have to get a little more reasonable. All right. And now we're going on to the general uh, Chinese, uh, fine Chinese ceramics and works of art at Christie's. This was a nice sale and, they had, and, they, and their sell through rate here was very high. It looked like it was 80 or 90 percent. The Sotheby sale looked like the, with the moon flask looked like it was around 60 percent maybe. And I think the 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 the, uh, uh, um, the, the Famille Rose vase uh, catalog I think they were probably a little better, maybe 70, 73 percent or something. I'm, I'm, I haven't done the exact math, but that's what it, about what it looked to be. And uh, then you had this though. This was really something. This was a a, a great gold and silver inlaid bronze. It was big. It was 14 inches. It had previously been sold by Bluitz and Michael Goodwees over in uh, London, um, and they put a, a fairly modest estimate. What was it? 100 to 100 to 150,000 pounds. But this was a heck of a thing. Look at this. Look at the work on this thing. 
absolutely elegant, very powerful, very beautiful, um, and in beautiful shape from what, what, what you can see. It didn't look like there was a thing wrong with it. And it did great. It brought 380,000 pounds, but right up, doubled its estimate, and uh, just a, a fabulous object. And then on over to the uh, bottom sale. This was the bottom's general sale over in Knightsbridge. And this was a nice little auction. This is, a, this is the kind of auction that if you're sort of a regular collector or a regular dealer, but you really love this stuff, this is a fabulous place to buy things. And um, we'll go to a couple of them, and we're going to look at just a couple things that uh, uh, I, one of them I had talked about last week was this uh, double spout um, um, Kangxi uh, ewer. It uh, had a very well-known Kangxi pattern on it, but double spouted with this nice sort of bridge handle going over the top. Uh, the estimate on it was very reasonable, 800 to 1,200 pounds, and uh, it did great. It brought 2,750 pounds, but a rather unusual piece, for sure, and uh, a nice thing. And they had a lot of good blue and white. <clears throat> it looked like everything here sold, uh, pretty much, as far as I go, or 98% of it sold. And uh, all of it went out nicely. This, uh, back up for a second, this. This uh, garniture set right here with these gilded handles. Uh, I thought this, these were very nice, a full set. Uh, they may have had a couple of little repairs here and there. Went for $10,000 for a set, um, which, which comes down to $2,000 a piece, but you got a full set. I think that was a good buy, all right? And uh, what's the next thing here? Uh, over to page... 16 was this. This was a, probably, the, I think, the most expensive thing in the sale was this very modestly estimated Kangxi Yen Yen vase um, with a court scene, a person being presenting himself, or a woman presenting herself at court. And uh, here he is with his, the emperor with his attendants and so forth. And uh, it was estimated at eight to 10,000 pounds. It ended up going for 32,500 um, pounds. So there's still a lot of interest in, in fine quality Kangxi pieces. And uh, this came out of a, a private collection in the UK. All right, there was no previous history on it that they provided. So, uh, at any rate, that was that was it for the sales. And uh, if you haven't subscribed to us yet here on YouTube, please do. Uh, we do at least one video a week, sometimes two, even three, sometimes if things are really busy if we're looking at auctions. And uh, come over to bidemout.com and sign up uh, for the weekly newsletter and uh, sign up uh, on the forum and become a contributor. And uh, We'll see you all uh, later on. We're going to do the weekly video uh, very shortly. Um, we're working on that right now. Okay. Have a great uh, weekend and see you all later. All righty. Bye-bye.